passages that he is going to be talking from. The first is Mark 3, verses 1 to 6, if you want to follow along. Another time, Jesus went into the synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man with a shriveled hand, stand up in front of everyone. Then Jesus asked them, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they remained silent. He looked around at them in anger and, deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts, said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was completely restored. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. And then the second short verse is from John 10, verse 10. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. So Lord, we thank you for your presence here this morning. Thank you for uh, the way we've already been hearing from you. And we just pray that you would gift Rupert the words to, to say, to communicate with us this morning. Thank you for all his preparation. And we do um, open our hearts, our minds, and our spirits to receive what you want to say to us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Okay. <clears throat> I'm still confused by that clock saying 1227. Um, so, we're in the middle of a sermon series called A Christ Like God. Um, often we think about we, we talk about Jesus being like God. Jesus is the exact representation or image of God. But this is turning that on its head and saying that God is like Jesus. I want to say that God has always been like Jesus. God is like Jesus and always will be like Jesus and cannot be anything other than Jesus. So we start with Jesus as the central main focal point of the revelation of who God is. And we've looked over the last few weeks. Uh, I did the first three, then Bella. I just started listening to Bella's uh, a couple of weeks ago, and then Joy led um, a reflection. And so some of the ground that we've looked at over the last few weeks is that the very essence of who God is, the revelation that that this coming of Jesus has uh, given us is that the essence of who God is, is love. In his incarnation and in the cross, this coming of Jesus, we fully understand now that God is love. And there's lots of kind of different understandings of love in our culture, but there is a specific revelation of this love of God that is revealed in the coming of Christ. And I use two theological words in uh, quite an in-depth theological one that I did, and we use the word cruciform and kenotic. Cruciform, this cross-shaped love, and kenosis, this Greek word from uh, Philippians chapter 2, that is sometimes translated, he emptied himself. He was poured out. And so we've been talking about this self-giving, poured out, self-emptying, sacrificial, non-coercive, non-violent, forgiving love. This is the revelation of who God is. And we've looked a little bit at um, this phrase that Jesus uses that's so shocking, I, I, I found so shocking, where he, he, he is inviting his followers to act in certain ways in Luke's gospel, and uh, he talks about loving your enemies and doing good to those who hate you and blessing those who persecute you um, and, and praying for those who do something, I can't remember quite the phrase. Anyway, he then goes on and he, and he says... Um, when you do these things, you will be like your father, who is kind, this is the 
incredible thing. He's kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Wow. That's the expression of this canotic and cruciform love. He is kind. So if he's kind to the ungrateful and the wicked, he's kind to everybody, without exception. Every single person. And then we've looked at the heart of Jesus. That this heart of Jesus, the only time that Jesus talks about his own heart, and he says, my heart is humble and gentle. It's not what you expect about a king. Same word is used of Jesus coming in on the donkey on Palm Sunday, that Sunday before um, his crucifixion. And we have this king who's humble and gentle. And this phrase is really about he identifies with those that are on the edges. He welcomes and includes everyone, but particularly those that are on the edges, those that are downtrodden. And so we have this wonderful phrase from Dane Ortland about his posture is not so much a, a finger that's pointing, but an open arms of welcome. This is what our God is. And so this morning I'm going to be covering a lot of ground. This is probably a product of 35 years of thinking. It's certainly stuff that I've been musing on. A lot of it is stuff that I've said before. I actually listened to a sermon that Colin gave in 2011 and he's not saying anything that different from what I'm saying today. I'm saying it in my own words. But this is, in one sense, a coming together. And I'm going to cover quite a lot of ground. So I've got seven images, I think it is, that I'm going to give to you. And I've been listening and re-listening to podcasts and reading and rereading books around some of this stuff, particularly actually in the last few years, wrestling with some of these things. And so I hope these images will help you. But you may, if uh, I cover a lot of ground fairly quickly, want to go back and listen to this again. And I can point you to other resources. I have got one book uh, that I may recommend here. So the first image that I want to give to you is that the essence of God is love, always love, and God cannot act. If his essence is love, his energy, the very nature of his being is love, he cannot act in any other way other than love. My love, our love, is always fickle. We love in very fickle Um, broken ways. But God, the essence of him is love. So always his action and sometimes when he doesn't seem to act or when he doesn't seem to be speaking and he is silent is always an act of love. And so my first image is a stick of rock. I was hoping to find some rock with the, you know, L-O-V-E right in there. But wherever you break rock, with a word in it, like Seaside Rock or Brighton Rock or Blackpool Rock, you will always find the same words. Wherever you, in a sense, if you like, cut or encounter God, you will always encounter love because the very essence of this revelation of this cruciform and canotic God is love. So that's our first image, is uh, rock. So today we're going to look at God's love and two other concepts that are in the Bible that uh, are the, the, the ideas or the concepts or the words, the wrath of God and judgment. Now, let me just say firstly, for some of you, these are phrases that you've thought about a lot, you've worked some th- things out, you found a way of reconciling Uh, in your own head and your own heart, the love of God and wrath of God and judgment of God. And uh, today I am not in any way wanting to undermine your faith or um, the conclusions or the places that you have come to. And maybe some of these phrases like the wrath of God and judgment of God are not particularly issues uh, for you. You don't wrestle with them. And so Today, if that's you, I'm not here in any way to try and undermine your conclusions and places that you've come to me, but I would ask that you just extend me some grace and maybe some others some grace this morning, because these are phrases that for a number of people we really wrestle with. And um, they are phrases that sometimes in the way that we hear them and the way that they have been talked about can cause quite a lot of emotional and psychological distress and harm to people. They are phrases that 
um, sometimes mean that people uh, end up leaving church and losing faith, alongside a number of other things that we're not necessarily going to particularly talk about uh, today, but things like hell, violence, the violence of, um, of the Old Testament, particularly um, some of the violence that seems to be divinely orchestrated and instituted, which we are going to look at in the, in the last two Sundays uh, of November. Um, how many people are saved or included, how atonement and salvation works. These are significant issues that many people wrestle with, particularly young people. And part of the exodus of young people from the church is because these things are not talked about openly. So if you've come to some settled conclusions about it and you're content in your own head and heart, that's brilliant. Please extend me some grace as I wrestle with these phrases that I personally find very difficult and I know many other people do. And it's often the reason why why people end up leaving church and leaving faith. So we're going to wrestle with these a little bit today. Sometimes we say that God, on one hand, is love, and on the other hand, he is just or he's holy. And I can see what's meant here, but I want to suggest that that's not quite right. Um, and the not quite right actually makes quite a big difference because it can lead us to a place where we believe that God loves us when we're good. But actually, when we do things that are not good, when we do things that are bad, then actually we're subject to his anger or disappointment. So this kind of, on one hand, God loves us. On the other hand, God is just and holy. I want to suggest is not quite right. And I want to offer my second image here, which is one of a diamond. That the essence of God is love. The very nature of who he is. So when you look at all the verses in the New Testament that talk about the revealing of God through the coming of Christ, Jesus has revealed something about God. It always says, in every time that I can think of, it always says it reveals that God, about the love of God or the essence of who God is, that God is love. And so the essence of who God is is like the diamond. And every other attribute, note it's not essence, every other attribute that we read about God in Scripture and we experience personally is like a facet of that diamond. It says something really important about who God is and how he relates uh, and interacts with human beings and his creation. But it flows from, it is an expression of his essence, which is love. His essence is the diamond. His mercy, his compassion, his grace, his kindness, his wrath, his judgment, his holiness are all attributes that are expressions of his love. They're like a facet, and we can gaze into that facet, and we see something really important about who God is. And these things are expressions of his love. So I think we can talk about things like his holy love, or his compassionate love, or his just love, or his merciful love, because they are all attributes that express this canotic and cruciform love, this cross-shaped, poured out, emptying love. So the second image is a diamond. We've had rock, we've had a diamond. As you can see, I'm going at a fair pace because I'm going to get somewhere by about 12-ish. Okay, are you with me? Okay, great, excellent. So the third thing we need to talk about is the nature of sin. And again, we're starting reading our Bibles through the lens of Jesus. Everybody reads a Bible, whether you're conscious of it or not, and you start somewhere. And I want to suggest that a really good place to start reading our Bibles and that we read the rest of Scripture going back and forward through the lens of Jesus. I think that's a really good place to start. You may choose to start somewhere else. Your choice may be conscious or unconscious. Uh, We're rooted in the Anabaptist tradition. The Anabaptists said Jesus is the central focal point of God's revelation, and so we read Scripture through that lens of Jesus. So we're going to think about the nature of sin and um, I, there's, there's this brilliant kind of summary statement that an angel comes to Joseph 
when Joseph is kind of wrestling about his fiancée who's pregnant and he knows that he's not the one that's caused this to happen and this angel comes and speaks to Joseph and says, you will call him Jesus. You will give him the name Jesus because, and here's this fantastic summary statement that I would say all Christians everywhere can agree. And it's, it's kind of rooted in our creed. We don't quite use these words, but it's there, I think, in, in, in the creed that Christians all over the place from all kinds of different traditions and, and streams and theologies and practices, we all kind of would say the same thing. And he says, you'll give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. So that's a great summary statement. But I, I hope it raises a whole bunch of questions for you. Like, well, what, what, what is sin? You may think that's really obvious. I'm not convinced it is really obvious. What's sin? And, and how does Jesus save us from those sins? And what's our part to play? There's all kinds of questions that are around that statement. And it's the answer to those questions is where Christians might disagree. So we're going to look at what does Jesus then say? How does Jesus begin to unpack that summary statement of he will save his people from his sins? What, what are the things that Jesus says about why he's come and what he has come to rescue or to restore us? So save can mean rescue or it could be restore. Something that is marred or damaged in some way, he's come to restore us. I think that's a really helpful way of understanding salvation. But it could be to rescue. And we're going to look at the Gospels and what Jesus says about the nature of his mission that brings some shape to he will save his people from their sins. And I've said this before, so if you've got good memories, this was back in 2019, this is nothing new. But a number of people weren't around in 2019, so it and um, on the basis that we forget about 99% of what's said on a Sunday morning, I'm going to say it again. Um, so there are three images, three and a half images, that I think Jesus uses in the Gospels. And I think it's really interesting to reflect on what Jesus talks about and what he does not talk about. And the faith that many of us maybe inherited when we were growing up. Because I think what Jesus talks about is quite different from what I inherited. So, there are three images that Jesus uses. The first one, uh, I've used the term trapped, so we've got bars. Jesus says, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. This word ransom is a kind of slavery image. It's about people who are trapped in some way, who are caught in slavery, and uh, they need some sense of freedom. And sin here, and this is, I think, something that is, is quite common through other parts of Scripture, sin is seen as, as a power. So often we think about sin as something that we do. We have this very individualistic action kind of stuff. I, I, I just think that's such a weak theology of sin. I don't think it takes it seriously enough, actually. Um, and sin is seen as this power that somehow has us in our grip. And so we may experience this in all kinds of different ways. We may feel we're, a, we're stuck. We may feel that actually we really want to change, but we can't really change. We're trying really hard but we can't really change in the way that we really hope to change. Sin is this power that has people in its grip. And Jesus says, I've come to set you free. So that's the first image. The second image is lost. And I think the image here is one of we are on a journey, a journey through life, and somehow we've lost our way. Somehow maybe that's through poor choices or lack of wisdom or lack of understanding or whatever it is, all kinds of reasons. But somehow on this journey, we have lost our, we, uh, lost our way. So Jesus says, for the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. We've got the parables in Luke 15 of the lost coin, the lost sheep and the lost um, sons. So 
on this journey, we're trying to stumble our way through life and find what it means to be flourishing and find human flourishing and human life. The life that Jesus has said he's come to bring. I've come that you might have life and life in all its fullness. And there is this way of Jesus that is a path, or no, it's not really so much a path, but it's a way. Well, it, it, yeah, maybe it is a path. It's a, it's a way that is inviting us constantly into life. And sometimes we just feel like, oh, I just, I've lost my way somehow. I've lost what it is that I'm meant to be doing or how I'm meant to be experiencing life. And so there's this image that Jesus has come to bring us back onto the way of Jesus, which is a way that brings human flourishing and life. I've come that you might have life and life in all its fullness. That John 10 passage that we have um, been reading. So it's, it's searching for this way of life, searching for a sense of meaning and purpose and, and, and value and life that we are uh, looking for. Now, I said three and a half images because I think there's another image that's used in John's gospel that I think actually is the same as this one, but he uses slightly different language. John uses the phrase blindness or darkness. And again, I think this is an image about we're journeying our way through life and actually when it's really, really dark and there is no light, it's really hard to find our way. Or when you're blind and you're journeying through life and you can't really see where you're going. And Jesus says, I've come that people might see or that I am the light of the world. So it's, I think, the same image that we're journeying through life And either we're lost or we can't see our way. And Jesus has come to bring us back onto that path of life. So we have a maze. That's another image. The third image is the image of sickness. So we have um, uh, the third image of uh, a sick person here. So Jesus, I think this is a fascinating idea and concept about what it means, what sin means, what Jesus is saying he has come to do when he has come to save his people from their sins. So Jesus says um, here, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I've come to call the right, not, I've, I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners. So here, sinners or sin is seen as being a sickness that Jesus is the great physician, the great doctor, the great healer, and he has come to heal the sickness of sin. Now, the problem with this, and I think this actually is really important, is that this sickness is terminal. It's a terminal disease. So the wages of sin is death. Please note, it does not say, that text, God will kill you. It doesn't say that. The text says that this sickness is so dehumanizing, stealing life, that ultimately it will lead to death. It is the consequences of the sin itself not something that God does to us. So the church then becomes a hospital that is about healing and helping sick people get better. And don't we know sometimes that there is a brokenness, a sickness in our own souls and our own heart? And we feel something is just out of kilter within ourselves. And Jesus has come to heal us. So we have three images here on the next slide. These three images, we have somebody trapped behind bars. We have a maze where we're trying to navigate our way through life and we're somehow lost. We've lost our way in some way. Or we have sickness that is taking away life. So my third major point here is that sin, as defined by Jesus, where we start and then we read out from there, diminishes human flourishing.
it undermines human flourishing and ultimately it leads to dehumanization and ultimately death. It corrupts our ability to thrive as human beings and it introduces a heart sickness to the human condition that entangles, distorts, and diminishes our original glory. So, Jesus needs to save us, rescue us, and restore us back to that original glory from this trappedness, this lostness on the journey, and this sickness, all of these things that dehumanize, undermine human flourishing, and ultimately lead to death. And so now, with all of that in place, this stick of rock that God always acts in love, the other attributes of God are facets of the diamond, and that sin, according to Jesus, is a lostness, a trappedness, and a sickness that he has come to rescue us from. We're now in a position to maybe think a little bit about the wrath of God, which is an impossible task in about 10 minutes, but I will do my best. (laughs) So I don't know how you hear the word wrath, But I think for many of us, we hear the word wrath through our human experiences. Malcolm's gonna talk a little bit more about this next week, about what shapes our image of God through our own experiences. But I think many of us can hear the word wrath as unpredictable, uncontrollable, violent, fly off the handle, anger because often that's how many of us have experienced anger right and there's a massive danger here of attributing to God out of our own human experiences and our own human imagery and yet we have no other way of speaking about God We have to use human language and human metaphor to speak about God, but that human metaphor is shaped by our own human experiences. And this word wrath, I think for many people, Greek word orge, I don't know if that's quite how you pronounce it, is actually a really difficult word to hear. And it, I think is also made more complex by the early church Christians and theologians talked about wrath as being one of the seven deadly sins. So something that's attributed to God, the early Christians said was one of the seven deadly sins. So we've got a problem here, I think. Let me state very clearly what I believe. I don't believe we can let God off the hook and say God can act in a way that human beings can't act or invited not to act. I don't believe we can do that. In fact, I would say Jesus is always inviting us to do the opposite. Jesus is always saying, this is who God is. Now, followers, you need to act like this. So when we talk about the wrath of God, and we recognize that wrath and anger is often sometimes seen as a sin, we have to be talking about different things. The wrath of God must mean something different from our own anger, so we need to be really cautious and careful, and I will do this in a minute, I am gonna use a human analogy, but we have to be really cautious and careful about the analogies and metaphors that we use ascribing to God our human experience of anger. Are you with me? This is some quite complex theological stuff that I'm trying to make as simple as I possibly can, and I'm loving that Jackie's really nodding vigorously there. Jackie, thank you so much. 
So I just want to note at this point that this is a really complex theological bit. You might think it's obvious what the wrath of God is. I think if you read some theology about it, it's not obvious at all. I've read some stuff, I'm scratching my head going, and I think I'm reasonably theologically adept. I'm scratching my head going, I have no idea what they're talking about. Absolutely no idea. This is something that theologians are wrestling with and coming to different conclusions. So I want to be really tentative and offer something, but if I'm really honest, my honest answer is, I don't know, maybe it's something like this. So this is my, I don't know, but maybe it's something like this, okay? But my starting point, so this, this, this I'm increasingly feeling reasonably confident about. My starting point is point number four, that God's wrath and judgment must be an expression of his love. If the essence of him is love, if he's a stick of rock everywhere you break, if he's a diamond, that these attributes flow out of his essence, which is love, then wrath and judgment must be an expression of his love. Which actually, immediately, I feel, gosh, if I'm really honest, some of my expressions, in fact, if I'm really, really honest, I would say pretty much all my expressions of anger are selfish in some way. I have very mixed motives. Even things that are big global issues that you might think don't affect Rupert, I'm sitting there going, well, if I'm really honest, I think my expressions of anger have quite a lot of selfishness and self-focus in them. So there's something intrinsically different about the wrath of God and the judgment of God because it's an expression, a pure expression of God's love towards the created order, human beings and all of creation. So with that, you might be wondering where we're gonna turn, when we're gonna turn to Mark chapter three, but let's just turn there just now because we're starting with Jesus. So we're not gonna start with Old Testament, New Testament, Um, stuff, we're going to start with Jesus. And I think this story is a really, really interesting story, which helps me understand a little bit about the wrath of God. We have this person who's in some way got some hand that is deformed. In some translations, it says shriveled, but there's something wrong with his hand in some way. And it's the Sabbath. And the Sabbath rules according to the religious leaders that you weren't allowed to do any work and they interpreted that as you wouldn't be allowed to heal as well. And Jesus sees these religious leaders and he sees this person that needs help. And his, um, doesn't actually, the text doesn't actually say this, but I, I, I believe the heart of Jesus is always one of compassion towards people, particularly those that are on the edges and on the margins. And so I think Jesus' heart is moved with compassion to this man. And he's faced with this dilemma of what do I do because they're these religious leaders that are there. And then there's this really fascinating verse in verse five. He looked at them, the religious leaders, the ones that were questioning what's Jesus gonna do on this day? Is he gonna break the law or not? And it says he looked at them in anger. What's really interesting is that is the same word as the wrath of God. Now, what I get here is not some fly off the, anger, uh, fly off the handle, irrational, violent anger. I, I get something completely different. Jesus looks at them in anger and he's deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts. Another translation, it talks about he's grieved at the hardness of their hearts. So, what was Jesus angry about? I think Jesus was angry at the sin and the evil that stopped the man stepping into the life and the fullness of life and human flourishing that Jesus wanted to give to him. But I think it was also 
as I've been musing and meditating on this passage, I wonder if Jesus's anger was also that these religious leaders were not stepping into the life that was being offered to them. So verse four is fascinating because Jesus says, what's lawful to do on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? I think there was something here that Jesus was inviting these religious leaders saying, you can see this a totally different way. Come and enter into the life that I want to give to you. So his anger was directed at what they were doing that was stopping this man with the shriveled hand, but also at the way that sin and evil was stopping them as the religious leaders. And Jesus was offering an invitation to them to enter into the life that he was, he is offering all kinds of people. So I don't know whether this is the best kind of image, but this is the best that I've come up with, and if you've got other ideas. I I wonder if the wrath of God is a divine no, small no, to invite a much larger yes. So we've got this image. Yes, I love this image. I I wonder if the wrath of God is saying, no, that is not how you enter into life and life in all its fullness, no. In fact, these things are ways in which will steal life from you, take life away from you, dehumanize you in some way. No, but it's to do a much larger yes, to enter into the life that he offers us. God, Colin was doing some teaching a number of years ago from Exodus 34, this revelation of God to Moses when he says, show me your face and this amazing thing. And just at this point, let me just reference this book by John Mark Comer, God Has a Name, which is a whole book around uh, this uh, particular phrase where he goes, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. Not leaving the guilty unpunished. And he goes into under, sort of interpreting this. I, I'm not sure I necessarily agree with it all, but it's really excellent. Lots and lots and lots of it. John Mark Comer's God has a name. Colin was doing some teaching, and one of the things, a phrase of Colin's that has remained with me is, God does not call wrong right. God will not turn a blind eye. And actually, this is a really good thing. So often we think of sin in very individual, personal piety ways, and and there's some truth in that. But I tell you, I'm really glad that God does not turn a blind eye or call wrong right when we think of just over a year ago, people at a music festival were suddenly murdered and raped. I'm really glad that God does not turn a blind eye and call wrong right when innocent people in Gaza and Lebanon and Ukraine and Yemen and other places of violence are being murdered. I'm really glad that God does not turn, uh, that does, God does not turn a blind eye when children are forced to work through their own poverty so that we can buy cheap clothes. I'm really glad God does not turn a blind eye when some man is convicted of hundreds and hundreds of cases of sexual abuse online. I'm really glad that God does not turn a blind eye to all kinds of things that happens in our families and in our churches and in our world. It's God's no to a much larger yes. It's his no to the evil that comes to kill 
steal and destroy. To say a much larger yes to the life that he is inviting us into. And the other bit that in this passage that I think is really interesting in Mark is Jesus doesn't coerce the religious leaders. He says, what's lawful to do on the Sabbath? Is it, is it to bring life? Or... And in the end, he lets them go. And right at the end of this little passage, they go off and they start colluding with the political powers towards Jesus' death. Jesus doesn't coerce or force or use violence to get these religious leaders into life. So some authors would say that the wrath of God is God letting us go our own way. It's divine consent to the consequences of our own sin. It's the consequences of our own choices, our own actions, and God allows that to happen. And I want us to notice in this passage in Mark, it comes at some personal cost to Jesus. It's at the threat of his own life. They go away and they plot to kill him. I think that's extraordinary. And for me, reframes something of what is meant perhaps by the wrath of God. Can I do judgment? Um, not in the time. Let me just give you an image. Um, I've, I've done some teaching on this back in 2019. I, I probably would hold to most of what I said there. Um, I think judgment is about fire that purifies. When we see this vision of heaven, the age to come, we see that all sin and death has been destroyed. Now it stands to reason actually, in the age to come we can't have a sickness that is dehumanizing people, right? So God has to find a way to purify and destroy that in any humanity that enters into the age to come. And the image that's used in scripture time and time again is one of fire. And so judgment is about a purifying, I would suggest, a purifying to eradicate all sin so that we can enter into the freedom and the life of the age to come without this sickness and trappedness and lostness. This is a good thing. This is an expression of his love. That's judgment in about 30 seconds. Um, but I did just want to do fire as an image. So I wonder if you could just put the fire image just up there. Thank you. So wrath and judgment are an expression of the love of God to save us from our sins so that we can be healed and free. Drew, I wonder if you could just come up. We're just gonna sing a, sing a song and move into bread and wine, but I just wanna finish with this quote. It's the Brad Jerzak quote. The next one actually, please, Luke.
That's the one. My eyesight's getting worse. So I'd just like to finish on this. I think this merits our gazing, our contemplation. To contemplate and gaze into the love of God. This, I think, is the nature of what contemplation is. We're contemplating the glory, the love of God. And as we do that, we are changed from glory to glory into the image of God. And I love this quote from uh, Brad Jerzak. To gaze on Christ is to receive his gaze. That is the glory that changes us from glory to glory. To gaze on Jesus and to receive his gaze back. That is, he goes on, that is the fire of judgment that purifies me from dross. When I lift my eyes to his lies, eyes, I find him gazing back at me, into me, seeing my heart, judging my heart, purging my heart, changing my heart, filling my heart. The active ingredient of our glorification is the divine gaze of Jesus Christ, fire and love, both now and into the age to come. I hope for some of you, this might give you a glimpse of some of these words that many of us maybe find difficult, some of us might find difficult. That it's an expression of the love of God. And as we gaze into this love of God, as we gaze on that diamond, we've had these images. You just put up all seven images there for us, Luke. We've had the image of the rock that the essence of who God is, is love. The diamond, that there are different facets, characteristics of God that flow from the essence of his love. Nature of sin, trapped, lost, and sick. And wrath and judgment is perhaps something like a small no to a much larger yes and invitation to life. And a fire that comes to cleanse and purify so that we become all that we are meant to be. Let's just stand for a moment. I've, I've said a lot. I've said it quickly. I hope it's a resource to some of you maybe to go back and listen again. And as we listen... Maybe our hearts can be stirred to go, oh, the love of God. So let's just take and pause a moment before we come and take bread and wine, just to gaze into this eyes of Jesus, the embodiment of love, the definition of love this cross-shaped, self-emptying, poured out, non-coercive, non-violent, self-sacrificial, other-benefiting, forgiving love. Let's just, for a moment, gaze into this love. This love that's then expressed to us in grace, compassion, kindness, goodness, holiness, justice, the Lord is gracious and compassionate. Slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. Slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He 
has compassion on all that he has made. As far as the east is from the west, that's how far he has removed our transgressions from us. As far as the east is from the west, that's how far he has removed our transgressions from us. Praise the in the middle of uh, this song we're going to uh, say our little liturgy about bread and wine and then um, invite you to come and take communion um, and this is our small yes to the much bigger yes of Jesus this morning uh, yes into the invitation to that fullness of life an expression of that and um and it is something, it's an ancient practice, it's a practice that's happening around the world um, today, and a physical gesture of, of that yes. So um, I'll read something, and then uh, if you could all join in with the last paragraph. The table of bread and wine is now to be made ready, so come to this table. You who have much faith, and you who would like to have more. You who have been here often, and you who have not been for a while. You who have tried to follow Jesus, and you who have failed. Come. It is Christ who invites us to meet him here. say together loving God through your goodness we have this bread and wine to offer which earth has given and human hands have made may we know your presence in the sharing of this bread so uh, the band will lead us as we sing again please come forward uh, take some bread and wine if you want to come in pairs and take it move away and pray together um, there's gluten-free uh, at this table perfect uh, gluten-free op option if you do have young children can I encourage you to come and take bread wine bread and wine quickly and uh, then go and uh, retrieve your children it's been a long morning for the children's workers um, that would be much appreciated I'm sure but let's uh, continue to sing and be in the presence of God if you'd like prayer um, please grab somebody um, and ask them to pray with you you don't have to say why but um, Yes, Lord, I thank you for this morning and this time to receive. For us to say you're our small yes to your much bigger yes. Let's take communion together. Is great. 
gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all that He has made. As far as the east is from the west, that's how far He has removed our transgressions from us. As far as the east is from the west, that's how far He has removed our transgressions from us. Praise the Lord, O my soul. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. Praise. leading us 
uh, this morning. Thank you, everyone, for being here and all of those who have contributed, the children's workers up in their rooms, the tech guys. Do stay for a cup of tea. Um, yeah, I think there's tea and coffee back there. And if you're a student, you can stay for lunch. Um, and I would just remind you uh, of the family meeting this evening. It's a really good chance for your voice to be heard again. Um, some conversation around our purpose and values and the direction um, that we sense God is leading from those purpose and values. So it'd be great to have that conversation this evening. Uh, as we finish up, let's just say the grace together. Uh, which might appear on a slide, but I also haven't warned Luke about that. But uh, if we can look around, if we feel comfortable, and say the grace together. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be with us all forever. Amen.